Hey, folks, welcome back. It's Ted at Ted Speaks. So we're going to talk today about a lot of fabulous things that we need to know about. Um, but number one is I'm hearing a lot of chatter about Bitcoin. People are still holding on to Bitcoin. I got a question for you guys who do have the Bitcoin. Please put it, uh, the answer up here on the right hand side for me. If there's 21 million Bitcoin, which one of the 21 million, if you own Bitcoin, do you own? So the idea with Bitcoin is that there's a finite number of Bitcoin. But the proof's in the pudding. Which Bitcoin number do you own? If you don't have a Bitcoin number, then what is it that you actually do own? And we're going to be tough talking on that as well. We're going to be touching on stock certificates and what the back of the stock certificates look like and why it's important to actually have a stock certificate. And this apparently is causing some ruckus on Wall Street because a number of you are calling up asking your brokers to get the QCIP, uh, QCIP vape number and also you get a paper stock certificate. But guess what? You're not going to get it. They don't do that anymore. We are very, very close to the meltdown of this whole thing. The cat's out of the bag. You came here for Ted Speaks the Truth. You've got it. So if you have stock certificates, what is the QCIP number? What is the number of the stock certificate? So again, we're going to go back up a little bit here. But the QCIP number here as a unique identifier, this tells you what the actual stock certificate number is, who the stock was issued to. OK, but also look at the daggone artwork that we're missing out on. OK, all this is completely digitized. Now, watch this. I'm going to take this stock certificate out of this envelope and I'm going to show you the back of it. Look at this. Now, do you see here? OK. Who it was issued to, the date. OK. This is what a stock certificate looks like. OK. This is one that's a real one. The person's name, the number of shares. The, uh, the actual share number, okay, and the number of shares itself, all right? Same thing on this one here, Pennsylvania Railroad Company, okay? Look at the beautiful artwork here. This one is by DuPont and Company. So let's take a look at the back of this one, okay? There is legal paperwork on the back of these things, folks. Look at this here, okay? And you see this real, you can see it's stamped EI DuPont. You all have heard of the DuPont Company, right? Okay. Here's a Pennsylvania Railroad as well. I went to a um, an antique store and picked these up. But each one of these you're seeing has a unique identifier to it. Okay. And on the back of this one is a surprise. Look at that. Look who's stamped as the owner of this. L.F. Rothschild and Company. Interesting. Okay. So this is what the document's supposed to look like or actually does look like. If you don't have one of these, what are you actually holding? Are you holding an original? Are you holding a copy? Or are you holding just simply some digits on a computer screen? Some of you are asking about the mess on my face right now. Well, I had to go to see the um, dermatologist the other day, and I think I got hit with a landmine. <laughs> anyway, um, I did the best they could without screaming, but uh, they put some pretty powerful stuff on me. So uh, you'll see this clear up in a little bit. There's no, really nothing majorly wrong here. Uh, did you know that... Uh, Joe Biden has canceled the loan repayment for 3.9 million people. And the average loan payment, student loan payment, which, it, by the way, is carried as, uh, on the, the books of the United States as an asset. But he just said, hey, you guys, 3.9 million, don't worry about making payments anymore at $400 a month. So what does that equal to? That's $1.56 billion in lost revenue. OK. All right. Per month. It's $400 per month, okay, times 3.9 million people. That's $1.6 billion in lost U.S. revenue on its number one asset, student debt. Do you see what we're talking about? Okay. So now let's move into what are black swans. A black swan is an event, a phrase commonly used in the world of finance, extremely negative event or occurrence that is impossible to predict. Absolutely impossible. Nobody can predict it. Yeah, right. Um in other words, black swans are events that are unexpected and knowable, okay? It is knowable, may be unexpected. So now we're going to go to the other end of the stream, okay? A white swan. Now what I'd like to do is I'm going to show you two tables full of currencies here that are now defunct, okay? And what I'd like you to do is take a look at this, all right? Now at some point in time, these currencies represented money, okay? which meant that somebody had to take their silver into that bank, all right? And they had to trade it for the note. Now, how come I have the notes? 
and who has the silver. Okay. Now, if you're real careful and you real, look real close, okay, you're going to see that I pulled a trick on you. Who sees the trick? Put the comment on the side on the sidebar there, okay? Look at poor Mexico. Look at all the different currencies they had. And who is holding this? I am. I'm holding this. Who's holding the silver? The people that get the traded you the notes for the um, for the actual cash. Oh my, what did we have here? See how it looks so familiar? See how there's a unique identifier on the $20 bill? On each one of these notes, they made it look real official, huh? Okay. So this is what you're going to be left holding with, okay? Unless you decide to take these pieces of paper that represent receipts, okay, for your money in the United States and swap them for American silver eagles or constitutional silver. Those two types of money are, in fact, money in the United States of America, okay? And we were playing a game the other night. Some of you might already know this about how many American silver eagles are on this table. Anyone want to take a guess? I'll give you a hint. It's more than a monster box. So, you folks, what I'm trying to do is show you real wealth, real money that is, in fact, immutable, meaning it can never go away. And it's not. It's not going away. So a white swan is an event that can have a significant impact on the economy, and it will. All right. Unlike gray and black swans, white swans are likely to occur and are predictable. They can be. This is possible because the amount of information allows the event to be forecasted. What did we just forecast it here? Every fiat currency throughout history has always wound up in a dustbin. Your fiat currency will as well. It just hasn't run the full course yet. What I'd suggest you do is hold on simply to enough of the fiat currency and get it into the money of your country. If you're in Canada, it would be so and maple leaves, right? Now, some people are saying, I guess you're saying you should go all in the silver. No, it's the other way around, folks. You got to turn your hat around. You're not going all in on silver. You're going all out of the dollar. And in Canada, you'd be going all out of your Canadian dollar. Okay. And in other countries, you'd be going out of your currency as well. Because money, okay, is what the currency is redeemed for when it is truly, in fact, currency. When it can no longer be redeemed for the currency, okay, for the money that we're talking about here, then what you wind up with is fiat currency. Fiat means it's that's the way it's going to be. It's a it's a decree from the law, okay, and um, that the that the population is going to accept dollars, paper dollars with numbers printed on it in exchange for their labor. How's that sound to you? It sounds to me a little. Uh, I don't I don't really like that because my labor is finite. What they're creating is infinite. And what they've created has over time, time and time, example after example, without exam, without the, without an exception, all fiat currencies die. So had these people that own these notes taken the uh, notes and exchanged them for the silver before the notes became absolutely worthless, they would have something now. They might have that bag of dimes or whatever that's on the table or the eagles, or maybe they exchange it for, for a gold necklace. One of the reasons I put the gold necklaces up because it was a true story about a young a family that was trying to make their way out of Vietnam during the fall of Saigon. And they had paid all the money that they possibly had, they did have, to get out of Saigon. And the family got to a river and there was another, I think they call them mules or whatever, to get them across the river. And the family was completely tapped out of bucks. They didn't have any more money left. The grandmother of this little girl in the family had given her a gold necklace many, many years ago. And she was able to use that gold necklace to get on the boat along with her family and get out of Vietnam right before the fall. So what I'm trying to say is that gold and silver are money throughout history. They always have been gold and silver. Actually, silver has been mentioned over 600 times in the Bible. And we've talked about it on other occasions as well, as far as how Judas was paid 30 pieces of silver to drop the dime on Jesus. So a white swan is an event. Let's watch for it. When I come out and tell you that the white swan event has landed, it's time to kick your feet up, get that easy boy out, grab your Mai Tai, get back, hug your wife, because the time has come for us. See, we only have to be right one time as holding eagles or holding silver and gold, okay? But if you're holding stocks and bonds and mutual funds, you have to be right every day. If you're wrong one day, you're out. We only have to be right one day. Which side of the equation would you rather be on? Our day is coming. Their day is coming, those of you that are holding stocks and bonds and mutual funds. And again, I just showed you this. If you don't have a stock certificate, you don't own the stock. 
it's like trying to walk in a bank. He said, why? Well, I, I, I had a hundred thousand dollars here. I don't know what happened to it, but trust me, I did have it. I, I have a statement somewhere. But our computer system says it isn't there. Folks, there's, there's, a, there's an old adage in law. that says possession is nine tenths of the law. We went over who actually owns your stock certificates. The Depository Trust Clearing Corporation at 55 Water Street. Their sole intermediary with the public is Seed and Company, C-E-D-E and Company. Look it up. But guess where they're located? 55 Water Street as well. Not a whole lot of separation there. <laughs> you know, if you spend as much time in this industry as I did, and you, you step away as I did for, what, uh, 15 years or 14 years or whatever, um, and then you come back and you see this market here, precious metals, it's like the wild, wild west. You guys are getting financial plans by people that, you know, graduated high school. <laughs> Lucky you. <laughs> uh, it, it's funny, but I do have a solution. I want you to hang in there. There is a solution that I have for those of you that uh, have been sold stuff that you don't feel that you were properly informed about, like thousand ounce bars in a foreign vault or whatever, or a vault that you don't own, even if it's in the United States. That those thousand ounce bars are really problematic. There's not much that you as an individual can do with it because you're not in that industry. Now, I was talking with um, with a coin uh, place earlier today, and they were telling me they have thousand ounce bars. And what they're doing is they take their thousand ounce bars and they send it to their refiner and their refiner makes bars out of it. If they didn't have the thousand ounce bars to make the bar, the smaller bars out of, guess what? They wouldn't have any silver. I'm telling you, folks, the market is very, very thinly traded. We blew the whistle on the type one versus type two. And now what's happened is people are going after the type ones. And guess what? There's not many left. So it only took one person on the Internet in less than a month talking about it a few times to dry up the whole inventory of type one American Silver Eagles. So now what the best deal is going out there is the uh, American, excuse me, the constitutional dimes pre-65. Now, the only reason you want to be looking at this stuff is if you have digital dollars or you have paper dollars that you want to get out of the system. If you already have silver and you already have gold, I'd count your lucky stars and you're fine. If you want to improve your position a little bit, since the gold silver ratio is so out of whack, it, we're currently looking at a silver to gold ratio of about 88 to one, meaning it would take 80 ounces, 88 ounces of silver to buy one ounce of gold. So if you have one ounce of gold, I would suggest you go get the 80 ounces of silver. You're not going to get the 88 because the coin store is going to make a living or something. OK, but what that will allow you to do is to wind up leveraging yourself a lot better so that when the compression, uh, when the gold to silver ratio normalizes and it goes back to a more normal ratio, you're going to find that you'll be able to accumulate much more ounces of gold, get the thing back the same ounces of gold that you've given up, possibly. So at any rate, um, there are a lot of opportunities to be made out here right now. And uh, we've just shown you that there's a tables full of examples. Now, there's two ways to learn. There's the, the experiences of others, which is an inexpensive lesson, or the experience of yourselves. <coughs> Pardon me. I showed you 88 examples. Pardon me. I showed you 88 examples of failed currencies on the tables over there. Are you going to be the 89th? or 89th or the 90th example. So if there's 89 examples of this uh, failing and all other fiat currencies throughout history have failed and the time is getting nigh and you know it's getting nigh because the cost of everything is going up. We also wind up with an inverted yield curve, meaning that it, it costs less to borrow money for 30 years than it does to borrow money at two years. Isn't that odd? What's wrong with that picture? The whole system is completely messed up. We're at the end of the global fiat monetary experiment right now, as far as Keynesian economics is concerned. Had we stayed on Austrian monetary economics, a real silver standard or gold standard, we all would be living much more happy li <coughs> happier lives, I think, much more comfortable lives. So at any rate, if you don't own, look at this, you don't own your stocks because you don't have a QCIT number. You don't own your land because the word land, I mean, you don't own the land because the word land is not inside your deed. And you don't own your money because there's no money in it. These are pretty, pretty powerful statements that we're making here. As a matter of fact, they'd be so damning that um, maybe uh, YouTube or a couple of podcasters might say, Ted, you, you're coming too close to the bumpers here and uh, we got to slow you down a little bit. But you want the truth. I'm going to continue to get out the truth and we're doing it on our own channel right here. So. This is what I would like to go over right now. In 1980, okay, look at this. In 1980, 
there were 17.1 units of silver coming out of the ground relative to gold. And gold, and silver, was $49 an ounce. Follow along here. We have a board coming. It's called a Vibe board. And it'll allow me to do the math up on a board so you don't have to do this anymore. But it'll allow it easier for me to show you what's going on. So now what we're looking at is a 7.1 to 1 ratio silver. Okay. And silver is $30 an ounce. So we've seen a 58.49% decrease in raw silver mining output relative to gold. But we've seen nearly a halving of the price. Here's your white swan, folks. That that white swan must be getting tired of swimming of uh, flying around up there. So, again, in 1980, they were pulling out 17.1 units of silver for each unit of gold. However, because there's been such a rush of trying to get the gold, the silver out of the ground, and silver is found closer to the sur the earth is sur uh, the earth's surface, we're winding up with an output right now of 7.1 units of silver to one unit of gold, okay? So that is, again, a 58.49% decrease. What do you think that should have done to the price of silver? So if silver was $50 an ounce when it was 17 to one, what should it be right now when it's seven to one? Do you see what I'm saying? I don't know what the answer is because all markets are manipulated right now, okay? But you're learning some things, you're learning that Life isn't quite what you thought it was. And that was the whole idea of our program here. So silver is actually insurance against the dollar collapse. And we know the dollar is collapsing because it's taking more and more dollar units to get the same kind of product or service that you used to have. So um, if you see digits as money, you're blind to what's going on. And I haven't done a real good job trying to wake you up. 75% of the global population does not use the dollar. 75%. Now, if the demand for the dollar is going away, what happens to the value of the dollar? So the value has no, the dollar has no intrinsic value. The dollar's value is simply based on the demand for it. Okay. So what we would like to do from here is there are some topics and people are raising some current concerns about type one versus type two or uh, other issues that are coming up that you'd like to delve into a little bit more deeply. What I'm offering you, if you're interested, is to join one of our investigative teams. For instance, if you have an interest in finding out what this diamond stuff is that the United States taxpayer paid to have developed during the reign of David Ryder, the then director of the Mint, and find out what was the scope of the contract? What was the contract supposed to do? Who signed the contract? Where did the funding come from? How was the funding appropriated? Who voted for the funding to be appropriated? How long did it take for uh, what kind of progress did they have on this con on this contract? And again, what was the ultimate purpose of the contract? Was the contract to be able to track and trace real time each American Silver Eagle Type 2? We want to know the truth. And the truth is out there. And people know the truth. But they're hiding it for some reason. I think I know where they're hiding it. And I think you do, too. So if you're interested in this. Bix Weir is the guy that has the information. He's the one that broke the story on this uh, about a year ago with a guy by the name of Dick Algeyer. The two of them went to Hawaii, and that's when uh, Bix Weir discovered what was going on as far as the contract was concerned that David Ryder, then uh, head of the U.S. Mint, signed with Honeywell to track our money. Isn't that the whole purpose of the Constitution, freedom here? I don't know about you, but I want our money honest and anonymous. Honest and anonymous. I want to be able to go about and buy what I want to buy. I want it to be honest money. I want it to be sound money. And I don't want to be tracked when I buy it. I'm an American citizen. I'm a free country. I'm a free man. And so are you. So what happened to buggy whips? A long time ago, they used buggy whips in order to get the horses to go. Well, when the horses went away and were replaced by the, uh, by the cars, there was a whole lot of buggy whips that were left over. What happened to them and what's going to happen to the U.S. dollar? Whether it's a $1, $5, 10 $20, $10, $50, whatever else, okay? But one thing I wanted to share with you here is that at one point in time, okay, back in 1963, this was our dollar. Look at the top line. It says United States note on it, okay? Now look at the size of this one and look at the size of this note here. They're the same size. But look, this one's issued by the Federal Reserve Bank and it's a Federal Reserve note. So if you have a note on something, what does that mean? If you have a note on your car or a note on your house, it means there's a debt, right? 
Okay, so this is a debt instrument. Somebody owes you something for this, as long as they're willing to continue to accept it. Okay, but these currencies all have a lifespan, and ours is our dollar is beyond that lifespan. And we talked about how the dollar actually got its name. It got its name from Thaler, T H A L E R. And if you do some research in etymology, you'll find out that Thaler actually meant a silver coin, as well as shekel, drachma, um, dinar. A number of these different countries around the world, they all have currencies that are have a root meaning back to the word silver. OK. So if the money is, in fact, mean silver and the Constitution says that money is silver, then why are you still holding notes at the end of the game here? Look, folks, type ones are still available. Type twos are all over the place, more so than the type ones. American uh, junk silver, pre-65 dimes, quarters and a half dollars, they're abundant as well, at least for the time being. So a good price on a thousand face of dimes will probably run you about maybe 18, 19,000 for a thousand face of dimes. Now, a thousand face of dimes will have 10,000 dimes in it. So that would mean if you're paying $19,000 for a thousand face bag, each dime costs $1.90, right? Well, if in fact that each dime, there's 14 dimes to the, uh, can you do that math for me? Uh, 14 dimes to one ounce. And if each one of those dimes is $1.90, then we're looking at something less than $28 for each one of the ounces of silver. So if you're going to pick up an ounce of, of a one ounce silver American Eagle, you're going to wind up paying about $33. So what we're winding up here is $26.60 is what you would pay if you're paying, say, $19,000 for a bag of junk. Now you can get a 100 face bag which would be $1,900 and so on and so forth. But the bottom line is, is that $1.40 in any denomination of pre-65 dimes, quarters, half dollars and dollars, $1.40 equals one troy ounce of pure silver. Okay. So silver's against the dollar collapse. It's insurance. And what we just find to, to finish talking about is that the world is moving away from the dollar. Why aren't you? We need to move back to what money is. The grand plan here and what's going to happen is all the fiat currencies around the world issued by the Bank for International Settlements are going to go away. And when they do, each country will now have their own sovereign money and it'll be backed by gold or silver. That's the plan. OK, so um, we talked about winning our money anonymous and real and honest. We talked about white swans. OK, next thing I'd like to talk about is this. My goodness. Morgan Stanley settled a class action suit for um, settling with clients who bought precious metals and paid storage fees, according to a court filing, like a vault storage fee. Hmm. The proposed settlement, which must be approved by the federal court in Manhattan, includes a cash component of $1.5 million in economic and remedial benefits valued at $2.9 million. I mean, you can't trust somebody who's holding your silver for you? Oh, interesting. You mean it wasn't even there? Oh, goodness. Possessions mine nine tenths of the law, folks. OK, if you don't hold it, you don't own it. But I guarantee you somebody owns everything. So if you don't own it, somebody else does. And if you're holding precious metals, you're probably one of the people that own it. So um, so we're talking about the the uh, the class action suit that J.P. Morgan is involved in. What else are they involved in? Well, they just violated their three-year probationary period of what's called a DPA or de uh, Deferred Prosecutorial Agreement. So what this means is that J.P. Morgan violated the law that they broke, which was a RICO violation. This is very serious. So if those of you that don't know what RICO violations are, basically it's racketeering when more than one company get together and they conspire to do a number on the public. Okay, And the retribution for that if, if and when found guilty, or if found guilty, is three times the damages, three times the profits of whatever it is that that, that company made. So it'll pretty much wipe them out. So let's suppose J.P. Morgan made five hundred billion dollars in one year, then their penalty is going to be one point five billion dollars. And uh, by the time the derivatives and everything else come come home, I doubt there'll be a whole lot left over. So what I would like to talk about next is Jerome Powell made an announcement at the end of the FOMC meeting. And he said that interest rates were going to stay the same. OK, what I'd like to do is show you that they didn't stay the same, did they? The interest rates actually went down. Now, the last FOMC meeting that he put up that uh, Jerome Powell spoke at, he said that uh, they were going to keep the interest rates in the, uh, the same as well. 
And I was confused because there's no way, because it didn't make any economic sense at all. And uh, I, I heard what he said. My friends are calling me. Colleagues are calling me. Ted, they didn't drop the interest rates. And I said, that doesn't make any sense. They did. Well, you got to go and you got to look at the two year and the 10 year. You'll find that actually what happened is the, is the interest rates did drop. So you're not being told the truth, even by the head of the Federal Reserve. This is some serious stuff. And I'm talking about I'm, I'm looking at a lot of information here for you. I'm telling you, you better watch it. It's time to get your money out of the bank. If we can pull up the U.S. debt clock, I'd like to take a look at something and show you um, a little bit greater detail of just what it is that we're looking at. And if I can find my phone here, we'll be able to do some math together. OK, can we get the U.S. debt clock up? OK, there we go. Now, I'm going to make full screen here so I can see it a little bit better. In the upper left, we went over this before. You have thirty four trillion dollars. OK, that's a debt. Now, that debt has got to be paid out of the United States. Now, the United States, the U.S. M2 money supply, if you go down about two thirds of the way, see where the arrow is here. OK, you'll see right there where Margaret Ann has a cursor, 20 trillion, 732 billion. That's what's in the checking account. But we just finished saying that there's over 20, 34 trillion dollars. You want to scroll back up and show them that. OK, up in as far as the national debt is concerned. So wouldn't it seem logical that we want to figure out the total number of claims against the, uh, the the money that's in the M2 money supply right now? Wouldn't we take the U.S. national debt and add that to the currency and credit derivatives now, which is six hundred twenty two trillion three hundred thirty eight billion? Now, these are some big numbers. You know, a billion seconds ago was 1959. A billion minutes ago, Jesus walked the earth and a billion hours ago, nothing two legged walked the earth. So when you start talking about a thousand billion, which is a trillion. I think we're talking about theoretical numbers, and I don't know how you bring reality to something that's theoretical, unless, of course, you're in a Potemkin village watching Kabuki theater. <laughs> then you can, then it's out in left field for you. Have a, have a blast. So what we're saying here is that if you take the 34 trillion of national debt and add that to the 622 trillion of claims against the M2 money supply, we're going to wind up with six hundred and fifty six trillion dollars that is supposed to be there to pay back the debt that we have and also to make sure that the stock portfolio that you might sell or whatever else that you currently have denominated in dollars is part of that 622 trillion. So if there's only 20 trillion dollars in the whole account to cover that, I did some math here for you. OK, but before we do that, I'd like to go down and let's take a look at just how solvent the United States government actually is. So let's get down to the bottom and you see the U.S. total national assets down there. See this right here. OK. And you see the total national assets of the United States, so 188 trillion, 11 billion. OK, but what is that number doing? Is it going up, going down or staying the same? It looks to me as though it's going down. So the assets are going down. OK, well, let's take a look at the liabilities. They got to be going down faster, right? Nay, nay. So the U.S. unfunded liabilities are currently 213 trillion. Uh oh, we only got 108. 88 trillion in, in national assets. Oh, my, what do we do? We're going to go bankrupt. Oh, my gosh. We already are. So the thing is, is that we're on we're on borrowed time right now. The patient is dead. And what we're doing is getting little nervous twitches and everything. But what's going to save the patient is the removal of the Keynesian economic model represented by the Bank for International Settlements and brought in with real money, God's money brought in by the Austrian monetary economic theory. So when your unfunded liabilities exceed which are growing faster and faster and faster exceed the u.s total national debt i assume you know national assets going down and down and down then the chasm is getting greater and greater between what we have and what we owe and this money is actually owed to retirees it's owed to investors it's owed to the people that have stock that they, or bonds they want to sell or stocks or the value of their house or or maybe they need to put a child through through college so this percentage that we're talking about here is only 3.1% of the US M2 money supply. So what I'm saying is that if you hold any digits right now in the way of dollars, only 3.1% of those digits are backed up by the US M2 money supply. And you're seeing that the M2 money supply is coming down and the claims against it are going up. So aren't we seeing this white swan about ready to land here at some point in time? Now, I don't know the exact date and time, and it really is important because once the time's up, the time's up. Doors shut. And those who are inside the party are going to have a blast. Those who are outside, they're not going to have a great time. So 
once you have the knowledge, you can either stock, uh, tuck it away in the back of your head or you can actually put the knowledge to use. What I would suggest, you got the knowledge, make sure, double, double check it and everything and make sure that it makes sense to you. If it does, then follow the path, okay? So we've talked about um, the, the BIS, how they own all the banks in the world. And uh, did you need to see that again or, or can we move on to something else? Let's move on. I was once given a book once and it was called Don't Sweat the Small Stuff and it's all small stuff. Those of you that know me, I, I do sweat the small stuff. But I thought I'd give it a, a crack because the guy worked for the Baltimore County Board of Education up on the hill there, you know. And uh, so I figured I'd read the book. Uh, I think I got about two, three chapters into it, and it just wasn't me. Don't sweat the small stuff. It's not important. Tell that to the astronauts that tried to go around the moon and come back home. Or tell that to the people that have developed the Internet. Oh, it's close enough. Just let that go, Charlie. It'll be fine. So anyway, if I started to read and quickly realized that if I abided by the author's suggestions, we would not have any of the brilliant inventions we have today. If you don't sweat the small stuff, where are the great ideas going to come from? So what I suggest is don't be stupid, people. Don't become the number 90 currency on my table that's gone defunct. Get the silver that is the redemption for the uh, for the, the dollar receipts, the dollar that dollar bills that you have. Get them swapped out. You can always take it and go back in. You can always take your silver and buy any currency on the face of the planet. And for those of you that have big stocks, oh, I got four hundred thousand dollars in a portfolio. Let me ask you a question. If the four hundred thousand dollars was in cash, OK, sitting on a pile. All right. Nice and safe. Would you go back and you make the same investments that you have currently? Meaning that would you take the same $400,000 that you have in cash and go back and buy the exact same equities? I think most people would say, no, they would not do that. So think of it this way. If the money is in fact yours and if it's cash, how would you put it? How would you invest it? How would you deploy it? So, wow, this close up on my face is really horrible here. If that doesn't get better, we're going to have to go back to radio. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think folks should we go back to radio <laughs> right. or maybe i'll peek over top of a fence or something wear a hat you know sunglasses or something that would do it so we talked about in 1980 the silver to gold ratio was 17.1 to 1 the ratio right now 44 years later is currently 7.1 to 1 that is a 56 percent reduction in the amount of output that the silver is, is that earth, mother mother earth is yielding from her crust. So in speaking with a fellow today, he was telling me, and he runs a fairly nice size um, uh, operation and they sell um, uh, silver and gold and bars and all that kind of stuff. He was telling me that if he, they didn't have their own silver, that they wouldn't have bars right now. What does that mean? They're having to take these thousand ounce bars because they're not negotiable and they send them to a refiner and the refiner then makes them into certifiable purity bars and they have different uh, stamps on them. So the thing is, is unless you have the ability to do this with your thousand ounce bars, it might be in a vault if it's still there at that time. Um, I, I, I think you're letting the tail wag the dog. Additionally, we spoke, if you have your money in an IRA and the tax liability currently is about say 28% of you were to take it all out at once, that means you're paying a lot of fees and you're giving up custody of the other the other reciprocal of that. So you're in a 28, 24% tax bracket. That means that 76% of that money could be yours tax-free sitting underneath your bed. You have to decide what you want to do. But uh, my dad always taught me a bird in the hands worth 10 in a bush. Did your dad ever tell you that? So the demand for silver is continuing to increase, yet the mining outputs are decreasing. And as a result of the decreasing mining output, the percentage of the mining output is increasing. So let's suppose that a constant amount of silver, increasing amount of silver is needed from a steadily decreasing mining supply. At some point in time, all the silver is going to be gone. And I have a chart on mining supplies and mining yields uh, from different um, uh, 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 miners around the world. And we're going to see that none of them really are keeping pace with the increase in demand for silver. Some are down like 18%. So these, um, let's see, that, that would be important to show these folks here. Um, as far as that, that uh, slide is concerned of the, uh, okay, 
but we'll get used to it here, folks. <laughs> Been an interesting day. So do we have any questions here that we can bring up? And anybody have anything that they'd like to talk about? We got a few more minutes left on, on the clock here. Uh, Margaret Ann, you gonna have to read the comments for me because they're not on my screen uh, and they're up I'm here. They're up here on the screen here. Okay. Not, okay. Folks, any, any questions? So we know what money, we know how to earn money, right? You're taught a career. Okay. You're taught how to earn the money, but have you been taught what act money actually is? Most people have not. Is money simply the digits that you're paid deposited in a checking account? Is that money? The answer is no, that's digital fiat currency. Okay, so what are you being paid in? You're being paid in receipts for real money, the constitutional money, which is silver and gold. Okay, and a question just popped up. Why push ASE, which is American Silver Eagles, when premiums are so much higher? I believe that you get what you pay for. And I think that if you buy quality, it pays off in the long run. So if you're buying American Silver Eagles, the world's most widely recognized one ounce, three nines, pure sovereign coin. OK, most of the people on the face of the planet have seen it. So let's suppose you're going to take a bar around and you're going to go in and you're going to try to buy the same good or service that I am. We're in competition for it. I have an eagle and you have a bar, you have a round. I show them an eagle who's going to walk out. And who's going to walk out with less in the actual weight of the silver than the other. For instance, if you have a thousand ounce bar, or any bar for that matter, you can't really trade that. So you'll have to take it to like a coin, coin store or you'll have to take it to a pawn shop. And in Baltimore County, in Carroll County, it says that in Maryland, it says that the coin shop or pawn store owner must take possession of that bar and keep it in their safe for eight to 14 days until a police report is run on that particular bar to find out whether or not it was stolen. So my question to you, if you walk into a coin store with a $23,000, thousand ounce bar of silver, what percentage of the $23,000 is going to give you? Now, to speak to the gentleman's point that just brought it up, he got real close. He didn't pay the, the astronomical premium. Well, folks, we're talking a real market here, okay? Supply and demand. You're actually seeing the supply and demand metric the way that it's supposed to, without any interference. Because the supply is finite and the, and the demand is from smart people. The demand isn't from a computer, an algorithm, Aladdin. Oh, Aladdin. we might have to talk about Aladdin someday. <laughs> but it was a YouTube channel here, too. <laughs> it's been fun 21 days, hasn't it? Anyway, so uh, we've talked about extra's pyramid, how, how everything on top of the pyramid is going to be melting down into the silver and the gold. We'll have better slides up for you next time. This was a bit of an ad hoc thing. Um, I'd like you all to put Ron from Ron's basement in your prayers. Uh, Ron suffered a, um, a health problem here today, and he asked if we could reschedule our program, which was supposed to be uh, broadcast this morning at around 10 a.m. So I know a lot, of, a number of you were on live uh, in Ron's basement waiting for us to come on, and I'm sorry about that. But uh, if you wouldn't mind including Ron a little prayer or something, uh, he's a great guy. He's gone out of his way to help us. You wouldn't be getting the message here right now if it wasn't for Ron because Ron's basement has attracted a lot of viewers. So in the in Ron's absence, you're going to have to step and up and you're going to have to do the job. You have to pass the word along. If you found some value out of this, please hit the like button. This you're doing for me. I've asked you to hit the, the like button before for Ron and also for Jared at uh, Stacking Surfer. But this is going to help our algorithms here. It's very, very important. So the greater the percentage of likes that we get to views, the more uh, the, this rises, the more this program rises in the in the YouTube algorithms. So how do I go about cashing in my metals when it's time? <laughs> cashing in. If the metal is money, what do you want to cash it in for? I'm going to tell you the way that uh, we see that this going out. OK, the American Silver Eagles and silver in general is very, very valuable. It is, in fact, the money of our country and it's the money of many other countries as well. So when these prices get up to astronomical prices in terms of fiat dollars or dollars or whatever you want to call them at that point, we feel that what's going to happen is the Treasury is going to put out what's called a clarion call to their authorized distributors because the, the Treasury know who's, knows who they sold the monster boxes to, right? They sold them to their authorized distributors. The authorized distributors told them, sold them to their wholesalers. They know who their customers are, right? The wholesalers sold them to the dealers and the dealers sold them to you, all right? So when the government, when our new government 
needs to back the new currency because this currency is dead. I just showed you 89 examples. And if you're smart, you picked up there were two stacks of $20 bills on those tables too. So those of you that may have seen this little example before, oh, I've already seen that one. No, you haven't. <laughs> because we put $20 bills on that table, which are today's currency. So we all know that they're that they're going to go by the wayside. So if silver is going to be unattainable, wouldn't the Philharmonic, kangaroos, et cetera, sell same as eagles? Well, it depends upon what country you're in. So let, let's take the question apart. If silver is going to be unattainable, okay, wouldn't Philharmonic, kangaroos, et cetera, sell same as eagles? No, because the people in the United States, they're not familiar with Philharmonics and kangaroos. I mean, when in Rome, dance with a Roman, <laughs> right? You ever been to Rome? I have not been to Rome. So uh, you need to have what's called the coin of the realm, okay? Google that term. It's called the coin of the realm. You need to have the money of the country that you're living in. So if or when silver becomes unavailable, what does that mean? Does that mean that you got all that you needed, all that you wanted? You exchanged all the fiat dollars that you had for the actual money? So there's a reason why in some countries, Amer American eagles sell for less or more than the, the country's home currency. Because the American eagles are the most fungible here in the United States. But I would recommend or maintain that the uh, Canadian maple leaf is probably the most accepted in Canada. Wouldn't you? Or if you're over in Europe, wouldn't you accept, ex expect that the euro would be the most accepted coin or uh, choice of currency? Speaking of that, we were in uh, Italy in 2004, and uh, we picked up some ceramic masks. So I thought, wow, I got a pocket full of dough here. So uh, we, we negotiated a deal on all these ceramic masks that were made over there in Italy. They're for gifts for people that are watching their children and their house and the dogs and all that kind of stuff. You know how it goes. And um, so we went to pay for the bill in, in U.S. currency. And the lady said, oh, no, we you no know, take dollars. Oh, okay. They said, well, how do you want to be paid? Euros. You're, you're in Europe. You take euros. <laughs> went in Rome, right? Okay. So she said we had to go to the bank and exchange the dollars that we had for the euros. And then once we did that, then we could come back and we could buy the mass. So if we'd have held the coin of the realm, we'd have been able to walk out immediately with the mass. Now, God forbid, so we took most of the mass that were in that store and no one came in behind us and bought the mass that we picked out. But the thing is, is that that's why you want to have the coin of the realm. You're not buying silver to save money. You're buying silver to make money. Right? You're not saving. So you're not buying silver to get it as cheaply as possible. You're buying silver because it's the money of your country. And I think you should be proud of your country. I know some of us are challenged to be a little proud of what's happening right now, but uh, I have faith that it's going to come back full steam. I think that uh, Trump is a very, very good businessman and he has quite a track record. He's used to running big businesses, multinational businesses and thousands of employees. He knows how to motivate people. He certainly motivated me. I was in retirement. Sold the practice in 2010. Was happy in, in 2024. Some friends said, look, Ted, you know so much about this. You really need to bring your, your, uh, your message public. So I'd like to thank one of the guys in our group. His name is Dave. Dave is the one we're here. The reason why we're here. Dave is the one that said, Ted, I think you're a natural for getting the message out and speaking the truth to people and teaching people. So uh, the question is, are numismatics worth it or get more ounces? Um, I would say that numismatics are not worth it. I think what you want to do is even not even think about getting ounces. I think you should consider and entertain the possibility of quantifying your wealth in terms of tons, tons of American currency. Okay. So not just simply a few ounces here and there. This isn't something you should dabble with. This is something that is going to take care of you the rest of your life and has taken care of other people throughout the rest of their lives as well. And now because it's been passed on, it'll take care of the rest of our lives here until it's our turn to go and our children take over and so on and so forth. Silver is a permanent metal unless you're using it in a consumptive type of way, like in a in missile or uh, in electronics where it, the amount that's used is so minuscule, it's uh, basically economically unaffordable. At this time, at these prices, in order to get the silver released from whatever cell, substrate it is that it's stuck to. So, so any other questions here? I think we've had a gut. And Ted, I do like you and the information you present. However, I've been listening to the sky falling for the past five years. Why should I believe anything is going to change now? Well, because I just showed you two tables of 89 examples of failed currencies. Do you think these people knew when it was going to go down? If they did, they'd go back and get the silver at that time, too. 
Look, what do you call somebody that always sells at the top and buys at the bottom? What do you call somebody that always sells at the top and buys at the bottom without exception? A liar. Okay. Nobody always buys at the bottom and sells at the top. But you can certainly get close because the stock market right now is, is just about at its all-time high. Backed off a little bit today. But should the stock market really be this high given all the other unemployment going on, empty office buildings, um, uh, rising costs, uh, the decreasing M2 money supply, the decreasing velocity of money? We're going to talk about that next time. We're going to talk about how GDP, gross domestic product, is calculated. And I'll give you a little clue. It's calculated by conglomeration of the, um, of the M2 money supply and velocity of money. So if the M2 money supply is going down and velocity of money is going down, what does that mean? It means that the GDP is going down too. Okay. So there's no way around that. Nothing is permanent, folks. Everything changes. Heraclius said that back in 2500 BC. So it was a, a German philosopher. And, but money needs to be have these qualities. Money needs to be durable, divisible, portable, fungible, meaning that whatever's in my pocket will do the same for me as whatever is in your pocket, the same thing will do for you. Now, are diamonds fungible? What do you think? Are diamonds fungible? Anybody answering here? The answer is no, diamonds are not fungible because you got cut clarity and color, right? Those three things. Every diamond is not the same. Everyone is unique unless you get a lab made diamond. Okay. But also money should be scarce. It should be something you have to work for, right? If you had to work to earn it, it should be work to get it, right? And get it out of the ground. How much work is involved in creating a Bitcoin? It's blips on a computer screen. And again, they said that there's 21 million Bitcoins. Why is it so hard if you're going to buy a Bitcoin for $64,000 or whatever it's selling for now? Why is it so hard to say, congratulations, Charlie, you owe Bitcoin number 1,298,000 or you own half of that coin or whatever? What leg do you have to stand on as far as what it is you actually own? So there is there one event that will catapult metals value? Yes, there is. Yes, there is. Yep. And you know what that is? Unavailability. Failure to deliver. FTD. When people buy something electronically, like contracts, silver contracts, and they go to stand for delivery for those contracts, and they say, I'm, I'm sorry, we don't have the silver. We'll give you the money. I got two tables full of that. I want the actual, you know, currency. I mean, we don't have the silver. They don't have it. But somebody does because silver isn't destroyed. So is there one event that would catapult the metal's value? Absolutely. When all the type ones are dried up, people are going to try to get the type twos. And they're going to realize that there's something, something nefarious going on with the type twos. Again, you research that yourself. And if you have questions and you're adamant about this, then you do the research on it. I've done the research on it, but you get back in and we'll make a report. We'll actually create it. We did this for Carl. Let me tell you about Carl. Carl is a guy that redid our silver chart. The only one that we had and the only one that uh, I was able to find. Uh, it tells you how many ounces of silver you need to be, what percentage of the world population. So poor Carl, he lives by himself and he has cancer. We would say a prayer for him. Has, I don't know to what extent it is, but um, he doesn't have any friends. He lives by himself. And he really can't make friends because he's a very, very bright guy. And I think he intimidates other people. So what we've done is we've offered Carl a section on our website. We're going to call it Carl's Corner. So messages from Carl from a man that's terminally ill. For cancer. Facts. It's a real life situations we're talking about here, folks. It's a real lives we're talking about. You've got to make the right decision. So, thanks for joining. I got to go.